Thank you very much for your time. I hope to give you something for it. I, uh, I don't mean to alarm you, but I just met you and I know roughly how much money you make. <laughs> Almost all of you. And not exactly, of course, but I do have a pretty good idea. And the reason I have a pretty good idea is because of a remarkable calculation that was done at the World Bank recently by uh, Branko Milanovic, economist Branko Milanovic. It's in a great book of his called uh, The Haves and the Have-Nots. So what Milanovic does is assemble for the first time uh, micro data, individual level data on the real incomes of people all over the world, most countries on Earth, stick them into a single harmonized database and ask this question. If he takes some random person from that database and he wants to predict their real income, real income adjusted for prices across, uh, across countries, how far can he get towards a perfect prediction of that person's real income, knowing nothing else about them except what country they live in? One fact only. And the stunning, to me, fact is uh, 60%. He can predict 60% of the interpersonal variance in real living standard based only on where you live and work. So I, I want to let that sink in for a second, because to me, this is one of the most stunning facts about the economy or the world period. Uh, we're talking about something important, it, your, your real living standard and all that means for your ability to realize your dreams and the health and survival of your children, et cetera, et cetera. And Milanovic's calculation doesn't just suggest that uh, where you live is more important than anything else about you. This number means that where you live is more important than everything else about you combined, whether you're hardworking, lazy, uh, black, white, female, male, your parents were rich, your parents were poor, hot, ugly, everything else about you <laughs> explains a lot, but not as much as your, as your, as your country of residence. So that's a, that's a remarkable situation. It's suggesting that there is an enormous uh, inequality of opportunity uh, in the world. Uh, and you can notice it in places like this. Here's the border between the US state of California and the Mexican state of Baja, California. And uh, the minimum wage on one side of that order is 57 cents an hour, and the minimum wage on the other is an order of magnitude higher. S same person doing the same thing. Another way to look at Milanovic's uh, fascinating results is to, to think for a second, well, you have the same person doing the same task in two different places. That's an arbitrage opportunity. It's a huge arbitrage opportunity. The same thing is being sold in different markets for hundreds of percent difference, often thousand uh, plus percent difference. Uh, and it's an opportunity to add value. All arbitrage opportunities are an opportunity to create economic value in the world, not take it from someone and give it to somebody else, but generate wealth. And uh, it's very common in the world to have the same person, to, to have a person who does a task for $250 a month in one place, be able to move, come to Washington DC, come to other richer parts of the world and do exactly, hammer the same nail into the same board for 10 times that much. So uh, Alex mentioned this paper called uh, Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk. And in that I summarized the uh, scant, there's only about five papers about this, but uh, uh, let's say nascent economic literature on calculating what is the size of this arbitrage opportunity? How much value could be added to the world economy uh, by exploiting this opportunity? And they're all kind of fancy back of the envelope calculations. It amounts to saying, well, how many people are you going to assume can move and what's the gain to each one of them? When you add them up uh, in, uh, in sophisticated ways, you get to really big numbers uh, in the trillions. The global GDP gain to even modest increases in labor mobility rivals and exceeds the, the global economic gain from any other kind of relaxation of international economic barriers you can think of. So what I talk about in the paper is that if you add up economists' best calculations of the global gain from dropping all policy barriers to trade, so it, total elimination of every tariff on Earth, every quota on Earth, every licensing restriction on Earth, and then add to that 
the economic gain uh, estimated by Francesco Caselli and others of total elimination of every barrier, policy and otherwise, to the movement of capital. So perfectly allocate capital across the entire globe, eliminate all informational uh, asymmetry, et cetera, et cetera. Add those two together, and you can't get to more than $3 trillion a year in global gain. Compare that to a modest increase in labor mobility, and by modest I mean take one in 20 of people now residing in what the World Bank defines as developing countries, allow them to work in richer countries, just one in 20 of them, and you get above four trillion conservatively. And larger amounts of mobility would, would result in even larger gains. So really just titanic uh, gains. And I, I want to uh, push back uh, gently on the brilliant presentation by Ethan. Uh, in that, <laughs> Uh, the, the, this is a gain that is uh, primarily realized instantaneously by migrants, but uh, these kind of population shifts occur over generations. So if you were to say in 1900, uh, okay, 60, uh, 70, 80 million uh, immigrants are coming to the United States and they're going to experience an economic gain over the next 100 years, but that gain would go to the immigrants. Well, now they're us. I mean, they were them then, but they're us now. My grandma came from Brazil in the 1930s, and she was part of that calculation. But I would also be part of that calculation, and now I'm us. So the, 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 these, these movements occur over a time scale where we, we should, uh, we should uh, uh, I'm not sure it's meaningful to, to talk <laughs> uh, in, in about us and them. Instantaneously, sure. But this is a gain to the country, because eventually the immigrants become the country. Uh, so what kind of doubts could you have about these numbers? Well, as I said, there aren't a lot of papers uh, 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 about this issue. It's an issue that needs to be studied a lot more. Um, a lot of what I write about in the paper is, is how we could challenge numbers like these. So what are, the, what are people doing in papers like this? Well, it's this very simple calculation of there's a bunch of people at a low uh, income level. The vertical axis here is just income. And what if we moved a certain amount of them to a higher income level and multiply the, uh, the, amount of, the number of people moving by the income gain? And you can think of four ways that you could critique this that are pretty uh, obvious. You might wonder, well, maybe migrants aren't quite as productive as natives at the destination. Uh, something uh, about their, their uh, productivity is less when they arrive. You could say, well, maybe there is a, some kind of bad economic effect uh, and a negative externality on people who don't move at the origin, and that, should, that offsetting uh, cost should be taken into account in a global calculus. Maybe there's a, an offsetting negative economic harm at the destination, uh, which, uh, which the other panelists have uh, talked about. And uh, fourth, you, you might have a non-economic concern about Sure, all of these economic gains, but really how many of those people could feasibly move in any realistic political scenario? So why don't we leave this uh, hypothetical stuff on the table and talk about things that really matter? So I want to take the rest of the time to, to just uh, uh, surf lightly over some of the literature about these different subjects. Um, first, let's talk about uh, the gains to migrants. So uh, you could ask, uh, what is the productivity of a migrant who moves? Or the reverse of the question, if somebody hadn't moved, what would be their economic productivity? If you took one of the many Ethiopian and Eritrean cab drivers in Washington, DC, and somehow teleported them to Addis Ababa, what would be their economic uh, productivity? And how would that differ between, uh, from the average economic differences between Americans and Ethiopians or Eritreans? So in a paper called The Place Premium, my co-authors and I tried to estimate for the first time the gains to immigrating to the United States. And we uh, try to account for as many observable and unobservable differences between migrants and non-migrants as we can. Um, we got uh, microdata from the World Bank uh, from the US and 42 other countries, stacked them all together, and asked the question, well, uh, how about an observably identical person from each of 42 countries in, 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 in that country and the United States? What is their real income? After adjusting for price differences, after adjusting for country of birth, after adjusting for country of education, and age, and education level, and gender. 
So the question we're asking is, take a Mexican born in Mexico, educated in Mexico, that is left after age 20, that's our definition of educated in Mexico, and they're 35 years old, and they have nine years of education, and they're male. Uh, and then make all plausible adjustments based on self-selection on unobservable determinants of income and ask what do you, what do you end up with as the uh, gap in economic productivity between that person in the United States and that person in Mexico. So here are the results for all 42 countries that we did. Uh, the vertical axis here is the multiple of that person's real income at home that they get in the United States. And the red, orange, and yellow parts are a sensitivity analysis based on the degree of self-selection on unobservable determinants of income. That is, the determinants of income are, that are left after you control for country of birth, country of education, gender, edu uh, education level, and age. And even after all of those adjustments, you're still left with hundreds of percent uh, gains. Um, to uh, another way to look at this is that the, the most of the determinants of poverty in Ethiopia don't come with those cab drivers. To, uh, to turn Shakespeare backwards, uh, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in ourselves, it's in our stars. It's mostly in where we're born. Um, how about the second objection about negative externalities at the origin? I, there's a lot of literature about this, and uh, I just want to uh, provoke thought very briefly on this uh, subject by taking a local thought exercise. So here's metropolitan Washington, DC. And uh, there are people in the world who believe that skilled migration from developing countries is so harmful that it should be referred to with a pejorative uh, rhyming phrase, uh, brain drain. And I, I, I don't use that. I just refer to it as the, by the neutral term, skilled migration, because uh, because for the following reason. Let's take a, a low-income part of Washington, D.C., say these parts of the city east of the Anacostia River where uh, incomes are uh, relatively low, and ask the question, what is the economic harm that is done by allowing smart young kids to leave those places, allowing them to live elsewhere, allowing them to work elsewhere? Um, Conversely, that, that, that's really exactly the same logical question as asking, well, what would be the economic benefit to those places of not allowing them to leave? That, that is uh, trapping them there, not giving them a decision about whether or not to leave. Let's set aside the many ethical problems that you might have with a policy like that and just say, well, would it be effective? Uh, well, you might wonder with, uh, how much of the uh, deficit in human capital production in those neighborhoods would be remedied by forcing the skilled people who have grown up there to go there. Uh, the same thing happens between countries. The OECD has estimated what, uh, by what fraction Africa's deficit of physicians would be remedied by the hypothetical relocation of all emigre African physicians back to Africa somehow by black helicopters. I don't know. <laughs> And the, the, the answer is about 10% of the deficit, as estimated by the World Health Organization, would be remedied by even that draconian uh, uh, a forcible relocation of every emigrate African doctor on Earth back to Africa. That is, the, the reason that doctors are not, being, are not in Africa is primarily due to very complex forces that are not remedied by forcing people to live one place or, not, or another. In this Anacostia example, you might also be concerned about whether not allowing smart young people to leave uh, that geographic area would affect people's education decisions. I mean, isn't some, at least some of the reason why people do stay in school and get uh, an education the fact that they can get high uh, uh, incomes elsewhere? The same thing does happen between countries. In my research and uh, the research of, of others, I, we've shown that uh, the education decisions, both the extent and the specialties of education decisions of a lot of young people in uh, developing countries are, are shaped by the opportunity to migrate, the option to migrate, even if it's not exercised. Um, the bottom line on this is that, and I, this is going to sound like a strong statement, but I, I, I know this literature so I can say it definitively, that there is no piece of, of uh, uh, evidence in the economic literature that any place on earth was ever developed primarily due to restrictions on movement, um, uh, or that any place on Earth was ever made healthier by restrictions on movement of health professionals, or any of the other uh, 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 
the, the uh, effects you might imagine from restricting people's movement. I think it makes a lot more sense when we try to contemplate the real effects of a policy like trapping people in a low-income neighborhood. Um, now I want to talk uh, briefly about uh, effects on people at the destination. Uh, I can cut this pretty short because uh, Madeline and Ethan have done a, 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 our, our world authorities on this and they've done a fantastic job. Um, I do want to point out that the, the long-term discussion, I'm alluding again to the long-term, the long-term discussion is not even worth having. Uh, ben Powell and other economists have pointed out that the U.S. got a lot bigger uh, between, say, 1900 and 2005. The U.S. got four times bigger. In 1900, we were a country of 75 million people. By 2005, over 300 million people. Uh, unemployment in those two years happens to have been exactly the same. So somehow all of that labor force entry, uh, a little less than half by immigrants and a lot of other labor force entry, uh, by, uh, uh, especially by women during that time, uh, seems to have generated, in proportionate terms, roughly as many jobs as it, uh, as it took. And really this is very intuitive when you think that in the long term, uh, immigrants and other labor force entrants are not just uh, uh, suppliers of their own labor, they are consumers of the produce of other people's labor. In the long run, we are all part of an economy. The only reason to even have this discussion or do economic research on it is, uh, is in the short term. And the, the most influential piece of research in this area is uh, by Ethan's uh, dissertation advisor, David Card at Berkeley, who studied this episode uh, in, a, in an influential paper in 1990. The Mariel boat lift, it was a one-off agreement between Carter and uh, Castro that allowed about 125,000 Cuban refugees to leave Cuba from Mariel Bay, that's why they're called the Marielitos, and arrive in Miami. 100,000 of them stayed there permanently. That means in three months there was this one-off, unexpected, giant 7% jump in the size of the labor force of Miami. David Card looks for effects on anybody else's employment or wages in the months thereafter relative to other cities that did not experience this gigantic uh, sudden uh, uh, inflow and can't find anything, nothing, even for blacks and Hispanics isolated, nothing at all. And I, I think it's fair to say that uh, even uh, 23 years later, it is still a subject of active research. How could that be? Madeline and Ethan have talked a lot about some of those reasons. It might have to do with uh, labor supply. The labor supply of natives was low in areas where these people ended up working. Uh, I, I have a new paper on that uh, subject uh, documenting that the uh, US workers' supply to manual farm work jobs in North Carolina didn't seem to be affected by the Great Recession when unemployment jumped from 4 to 11%. That is, in economic terms, the, the, for some jobs that immigrants are doing, the native labor supply curve seems to be not just almost zero, but, but locally, locally uh, inelastic. Uh, it could have to do with uh, uh, labor demand, that there's, there's something about uh, large inflows of immigrants that stimulate demand. In economic terms, not just driving other workers down the labor demand curve by competing with them, but actually shifting outward the labor demand curve. And Ethan talked about all kinds of mechanisms for this. Uh, firms adjust their technology choices uh, in response to the availability of labor. Uh, Ethan's research has been very influential there. Um, uh, Jenny Hunt, who is at Rutgers and is now the US Department of Labor Chief Economist, has a fascinating new paper showing that natives adjust their educational choices based on the presence of low-skill migrants uh, Patricia Cortes at Boston University has some very innovative work showing that skilled women's labor force participation choices are influenced by the availability of low-skill migrants. And you can imagine how that works primarily through the availability of uh, affordable child care and elder care. All kinds of things that stimulate economic activity and therefore the demand for other people's labor, including natives and including low-skill natives. Lots of lots of things going on here, as Ethan said. The, the mental model of one labor demand curve, and is it downward sloping or not, that's the title of Borjas's 2003 paper, uh, is much, much, much simpler than the, than the actual economy. So uh, I want to talk finally about uh, feasibility, and then, uh, then I'll finish. Um, and this is where uh, this economist uh, departs completely from economics. Uh, people, even people who agree entirely with every word I've just said, often just pat me on the back and say, you know, good luck with that, because uh, <laughs> that's impossible. 
And I just want to point out that in America, lots of things are impossible until they're possible, and then they're possible. And to, to me, one of the most inspiring documents in all of US history is this letter from Ben Franklin to Congress in February 1790. And uh, you might know that Franklin died in April of 1790. So this is the last public act of his life. He dashed off a letter uh, representing a Quaker association saying, how about if you guys abolish slavery right now in 1790? Not just end the slave trade, but actually make it illegal for human beings to own other human beings today. And you all know that it was generations before that actually happened or was even discussed in Congress again, but it was debated for two days. And there, uh, they didn't keep uh, full transcripts in those days, but there are steno notes of the discussion. And they gave all sorts of practical objections to this. You know, who's going to compensate the uh, property owners for all the expropriation? Uh, go back to the Greeks and Romans. Slaves have always been with us, et cetera, et cetera. There's even some hilarious parts where they say, you know, Franklin is in getting old and he's a little, you know. <laughs> uh, and they were right at that time. Now they seem crazy. And Franklin turned out to be right. It took a while. But uh, things can change massively. And uh, there's a vast, vast opportunity out there that uh, I think slowly the world is finding ways to, to realize. And uh, uh, it deserves a lot more research. Thanks.